so this is the Iowa City City Council work session for June the 18th, 2019. And the first item is to hear a review from Dr. Chris Bernard. Barnum. Barnum, I'm sorry, excuse me, Dr. Chris. Um, Just Barnum. Just yeah. Barnum, Barnum and Bailey. Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> Barnum and Bailey. My bad. Better be good, Don. Better, better be good. <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Barnum's going to review uh, the 2018 Police Department traffic stop data. And I think the chief is going to introduce. Chief, you're going to come up? Sure. Good evening. Jody Matherly, police chief. Um, as you know, every year for this, the, fa the past several years, we've uh, critiqued ourselves and measured ourselves and looked at data and trends on how we're doing with disproportionality and minority contact. And uh, as it's been said before, you know, we're, our, we're a big critic of ourselves and, and we like that. We like to make sure that we're doing what's expected with uh, good policing practices and what the community expects. And Dr. Uh, Barnum from St. Ambrose has been a critical piece of that. Uh, the upside from having him here year after year is he knows uh, our city, our system, um, and so there's consistency in how this is done and that's, that's key for us. It's not different every year. Uh, he sat down uh, a few weeks ago and walked through some of the preliminary findings, um, so he's ready to present those tonight. And uh, I would just will let you know that um, with the help of, of uh, Captain Brotherton and, and Captain Campbell and the rest of the police department, we continue to work on bias-based policing. We're in the middle of training for that right now as we speak, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, and look at other ways that, that we can reduce disproportionality. Uh, and I think we're making progress. So uh, I just met with some folks from the school today when we talk about the high amount of suspensions for uh, uh, black females in the school systems, and not just in Iowa City, but nationwide. And um, you know, my comment was, you know, think things can be fixed. This is not beyond our control. It takes uh, it takes good leadership, but it but it takes good training, good direction, and a change of culture in how we do things, and I think we're achieving that at the police department. So with that, I'll let Dr. Barnum have the floor unless there's any questions, and we'll go from there. Sounds good. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. So Dr. Barnum, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to end your presentation and our discussion by 545. Do you think that's, that's reasonable target? Yeah, I think that's certainly reasonable. Okay, that's what we're shooting for, folks. <clears throat> Uh, so thank you for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Um, one thing before I get started, I, I've had to, some computer issues. So when I get to uh, the slides on individual disproportionality, the slide on my screen is incorrect. And I've been working all day trying to fix it. So I'll go to the, um, the Word document, which I sent to you all, which is correct. Mm -hmm. It's just for some reason on my PowerPoint. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. So just a heads up as we get going. So again, this is, uh, as the chief said, this is the, um, boy, this is like um, almost 10 years now we've been doing the data here. And uh, so we, we have a pretty good run going. Uh, we're able to look longitudinally at the data. So we have a feel for which direction everything's heading and so forth. So I'll just run you through kind of what we do real briefly, uh, mm. the background, and then uh, we'll get into the findings here. So, um, so when Iowa City reports a stop, they the stops come up uh, in, uh, in terms of different one mile square grids uh, that the city's been mapped out at. And so when I receive the data, uh, the stop, where the stop occurred, I can tell where it happened according to which grid it was in. So what we essentially do then is we go into these different areas, particularly the areas where a lot of stops are made, and we, um, we watch traffic essentially to see the um, racial proportions of the drivers on the roads. So, and we've been doing that since 2007, so I guess it's 12 years now. And we've made so far, which I'll show you in a second, over 100,000 observations. And I'll show you where we mainly look and the reasons why. And that establishes our benchmark that we then compare the police data to. So that's kind of what, what we do. We get the, the data from the police department, and then we compare it to our benchmarks. And, and we look to see if there's any difference between those. So these are the number of stops by those different zones. Um, 
So you can see <laughs> most of the stops are made in a particular zone, and that happens to be zone 21, which is the downtown area. So it's right here. So uh, of the over 12,000 stops made by the police department, the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of those were made in the downtown area. And then there was uh, quite a few made in Zone 29, which is the Broadway Cross Park area, and then the surrounding zones around that. Zone 13 is uh, just north of downtown on Dubuque Street there. So you can see where the stops are made. And those are the areas we, we like to really watch traffic in to establish our benchmarks, because that's where all the stoppings occurring at. So. This kind of lays it out for you where the stops are being made um, on the map. So the area in red is where the stops are most frequently made, and then in yellow are the areas where the stops are still higher than the, the rest of the town, but not as high as the downtown area. And this breaks out the number of stops by the police department, uh, breaking it out by day or night. Uh, for us, a day is from 7 a.m. to 7 at night. And the opposite is nights. That's how we split the data in terms of days and nights. And it, it's not really an issue, but it, it kind of matters for our benchmarks, uh, whether it's dark or light out. <clears throat> so this uh, slide breaks out the total number of uh, observations we've made uh, since 2007. You can see we're up over 110,000 now. And these are the areas we really concentrate on looking at when usually my grads, it's usually grad students, come up here and, and watch traffic. And we tend to do that. Um, we just finished a year of doing that. They, they were up here not every day of the year, but the, over the course of the year, we, we hit every day of the week. We hit pretty much every hour of the day. We hit uh, football weekends and so on and so forth. So we, we have a pretty good feel for um, what the benchmarks are in those areas. So specifically, these are the zones that get watched heavily. Uh, and that just corresponds to the map. These are the benchmark values that we have established. And those are really simple. We just simply aggregate. So the people who are watching the, uh, the traffic, they, they mark. Uh, white male, black male, white female, so on and so forth, and then we just count them. And we aggregate them across different observers. We use uh, some techniques to, to check validity. The validity is generally pretty good, which means that one person's seeing pretty much the same thing as everybody else, which we like to see. And you can see there's a little bit of difference in the benchmarks between day and night in some of the zones, but not in all of them. Now, in areas where we don't watch heavily, we just use a standard uh, 0.1 or 10% of the drivers are minority drivers uh, in those areas. And that's based on census figures. But there's not very many stops made in those areas. It wouldn't be very cost efficient to really watch areas where there's few stops made, because I have to, well, you guys actually have to pay our grad students for coming up here and looking at the traffic. So <clears throat> that's why we do that. So just so, you, so it's clear, this, this 0.10 number means that uh, what we saw in Zone 13 was 10% uh, of the drivers on the roads were minority drivers in that area. And then you can, the rest of it corresponds on the way down there. Uh, I always give this caveat, so keep in mind with the benchmarks, they're not absolute. They're a sample of the traffic on the roads. And in, like any sample, there's sampling error. It's, it's uh, impossible to estimate the amount of error because we don't know the sample size. It's infinite. So um, I don't know how, how large the area is. I can guess, based on what we see from year to year, that our benchmarks are probably within three percentage points either direction, because we tend to see the same things. But um, I probably can't guarantee that. So here's the data from 2018. And this is just from the entire department, which looks just like what I showed you in the earlier slide. This, this just shows where the stops are being made. Again, zone 21, 29, 13. Those areas that I showed you on the map are where all the stops are being made by the police department in general. Now, this next slide is actually what you want to see. 
And this is the slide that compares the percentage of police stops to our benchmarks. So the percentage of police stops are the blue lines and our benchmarks are the red lines. And graphs like these are a little bit deceiving because in areas where it looks like there's a whole lot of uh, difference, which we call uh, disproportionality. For example, here in zone 19, you can see that the percentage of police stops is a lot higher than our benchmark. But if you go back to this and you look at 19 right here, you can see that there's almost, there's very few stops made there. So although there's disproportionality there, it's based on a small number of stops. So what we really like to look at are the areas where there's lots and lots of stops being made. And if we find disproportionality there, that's more of a problem. So zone 21 is where there's a lot of stops being made. And that's uh, these two bars right here. And you can see there's a little bit of disproportionality, but not nearly to the extent as what we saw in uh, Zone 19. And so what we do to try to uh, make this a little bit more interpretable is we, uh, we simply um, calculate a weighted average across each of the zones. So we compare the difference between the uh, police stops and the benchmark, and then weight it by the number of stops made there. And that's where we get that number. So what that means, this value of 0.07, is that on average, the, per, the percentage points, uh, there were the police, the percentage of police stops was seven uh, percentage points higher than our benchmarks, weighted by the number of stops across all, all the zones. You all with me? Okay. And then we did, we split it out by days and nights. So here's the pattern of stops for days, which are very similar to the department as a whole, and nights will be similar as well. And uh, here's the level of disproportionality. On days, it's a little bit lower than it is for the department as a whole. I would say in zone uh, 28, there's a fair amount of disproportionality and a fair amount of stopping there. So that might be an area that they might want to look at a little more closely. And then for nights, <clears throat> the pattern again is the same. Most of the stops are made downtown. And the level of disproportionality is uh, nine percentage points higher than our benchmark. So that's higher than the, the average. Days, low, days are pulling the average down for the whole department and nights are pulling it up. So on night, there's a little bit more disproportionality than there is during the day is what the, the bottom line on, on these data are. Is there any comments or questions on this so far? Okay. So now we're getting into the officer level analysis. So the first slide I'm going to show you is correct. The second slide I'm going to go to uh, a word doc to show you so I can compare it uh, because there's, there's a problem with, the, with this. So um, this is just the formula of how we actually compute this index. We compare, for each officer, we compare the percentage of uh, minority stops to the benchmarks and divide that by the the percentage of non-minority drivers over that benchmark, and that, that equals a, a number. So any number essentially bigger than one means some sort of disproportionality, so that's what we look for. A uh, number one would be you're equally likely, given the benchmarks, to stop a minority versus a non-minority driver. So numbers larger than one are what we look for. <clears throat> So here's the slide. Um, so these are the values along here of that index, which I was talking about. Uh, this blue dashed line here is, is sort of what we consider a bare minimum for analyzing an officer, and that's uh, 100 stops. If they're not above 100 stops, then sometimes the numbers can get kind of um, messed up because the, 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 the number of, the, the 
it can be noise in the data that are, you know, the law of large numbers isn't in effect if you don't have at least 100 stops. So you might be seeing what you think is uh, disparity or disproportionality, but it's really just noise. So the more stops, the better in kind of the benchmark that we use. Pretty much everywhere we go is uh, 100. We, we'd like to see 100 stops before we start really analyzing the officer's data. So anybody above the line will look at, so this is the number of stops on the y-axis over here. So you can see this officer right there made over 1,000 stops. And then uh, this line right here, this lightly dashed line is the 90th percentile, and this heavily dashed line is the median for the department. So the median in uh, 2018 was under two, it was between one and two. I think it's probably, just looking at that, probably around uh, 1.7, um, which is lower than it has been. Chris, I'm looking at the material we got in our handout. So the chart that's similar to this one is called Figure 8 Officer Index Values 2018. Yeah, let me get and, and it. And what you have on the screen is very similar, but it's not identical. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Yeah, let me this, just pull this, up that for right The scale right here. differs, and actually some of the individual officers' blue dots are different. Yeah, let's, let's, I'll just pull it up and we'll look at that one. I don't trust, um, I trust this one. I, like I said, I could not transfer that graph to the PowerPoint for some reason. Okay. So these are the two charts I want to look at. So this is the one I was just showing you right here. And so this is the 2018 data. I don't know. We're not seeing anything. Oh, you, you guys don't see it? We just see the, the, the graphic you initially showed us. I'm getting, so now I'm getting... Uh, Please wait while it logs in. Sorry. I think it's what's loading. up here now is the same as what's in the late handouts. In the late handout? Yeah. Okay, I didn't have a chance to go through the late handout, so I'm looking at what we got initially. So one of the charts was a little, little off for comparison, so we updated it. Okay, so this one, this one is that's up there right now. It's so accurate. Updated, so you might have the old one. And this uh, is it's for this, this one. Right. And, and so, this that, is, so the old one, the scales were different. So I just made the scales identical. And 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 when I did that, it for some reason the PowerPoint wouldn't take it. So um, can you see it now on your screens? Yeah, it's on uh, our screens. Well, yeah, I see what you initially put up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is correct data here. These are correct. So, um, so I guess the way to look at this and then is to compare it to the year before. And this was the one I couldn't bring up on the data, um, this chart. So you can see here, as you, we go back and forth, we have an officer um, that was above 100, the 100 mark uh, threshold, the 100 stop mark threshold, and had a uh, relatively high disparity index there, over four, up around five. Uh, and in the 2018 data, that isn't the case anymore. So that that's no longer a problem. Uh, one other thing you'll you'll notice is that the median has has gone down in 2018 as compared to 2017, which is good. That's that's progress. Um, These officers here sh are showing a lot of disproportionality. I'm looking at 2018, but they're not at 100 stops. So although they count in calculating the median in the 90th percentile, um, some of that could be due to noise in conjunction with uh, considering that the, the benchmark's a sample, too. So the more stops, the better when you're looking at this thing. Dr. Barnum, we, we can't see the mouse when you're... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. So, well, I'm... You're looking at, just if you can describe what you're yeah, looking at, so, that would help. <laughs> you can't tell where I'm pointing either. <laughs> so it's, it's um, the five dots yeah. below the blue line, but right by the four the right there. Side. Got the laser on the way. Now I have to figure out how to use it. The way. <laughs> okay. 
lazed myself. Uh, Just don't. Sh there we go. Don't name it, Jody. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to show you another graph, which is in the PowerPoint, which is correct, which is from 2016, too. So I'll go to that unless you have some questions on this. I think it came up, did it? No, we don't see it. Try again. It's thinking. <laughs> Maybe it's actually meditating. <laughs> it might be meditating. <laughs> Mindfulness. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, because it's not coming up, I'm going to try to reopen it. Let's see if we can do it that way. Coming up. So it's just frozen, I guess. Let me exit this one. <laughs> so I can see it on my screen, but it's not coming up on that screen. What? Take a look and see if there's something. Yeah. There you go. Got something different. Okay, we're doing. There. Yeah, I keep we should going. Should be able to move. Okay. Move through this. Okay, great. Thank you. So right. this is uh, from 2016, and 17. Uh, no, that this is 16 now. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Yeah, this is 16 now. So uh, this is not in your handouts. This is this is the year before that. And let's see if I can figure this out again. So they, this uh, dot right here is now up around six. It was like at five and 17, and that's the same officer. So uh, one good thing about that is that's not a, an issue in the 2018 data. And um, again, the, the median has gone down since 16. So that looks like progress. Any questions? What's the median now? It's... Um, or for 2018? Yeah, it, I'll show you. So it's... Oh, I see. It's there compared to... Yeah, so it's like 1.8 versus yeah, 1.95 or something yeah, like that. Huh? Something like that. Good. So that's moving in the right direction. So then the other part that we always look at are stop outcomes. And stop outcomes are citations, arrests, searches, essentially. We look at if there's a disparity in those. And, and for these, we don't need a benchmark. We can just look at the data, and we can compare how drivers are treated once they're stopped each other. It's, it's a lot more straightforward. You don't have to worry about the benchmarks and so forth. Uh, we, we compute an odds ratio to do this, which is simply a comparison of two odds. It gives you uh, an idea of effect size and the difference between how one group is treated in comparison to the other. And so here's the raw data and then the, the odd ratio. Oops, sorry about that. The odd ratio is, uh, it's a simple odd ratio right there. 
So that's, that's one, essentially, which is good, because uh, the number one means that the odds are equally likely that after a traffic stop occurs, a minority driver will see, receive a citation as compared to a non-minority driver. And uh, that's been pretty stable the last couple years, and so that's a good thing. So there's no, no really difference in terms of who gets a ticket once they're stopped in Iowa City. So this is a summary of arrests. In, in, in this slide, all arrests are grouped together. I'm going to break it out here in a minute. But um, when an arrest is made on a traffic stop, the odds are twice as likely that a black driver will be arrested in comparison to a, a, a white driver or a minority compared to a non-minority. And so, um, so I, um, sort of a, a way to look at that is that there, the minority drivers are twice as likely to get arrested as a non-minority driver on a traffic stop. But as you're going to see, it's a little more complicated when you think about it because some stops are discretionary in, in nature, which means the officer has a choice whether or not to make this, the arrest. And other stops or arrests are non-discretionary, so the officer doesn't really have a choice on those. So we look at, we compare those. And so what we hope to see in terms of good numbers are for discretionary stops, the ones where the officers have a choice, the number is lower than for non-discretionary stops. And it is. So for discretionary stops, that number is uh, 1.3 instead of 1.9. So it's much closer to one than it was before. Now you can see there's not that many of them. There's only 74 of those that occurred. And out of, out of 712 arrests that were made on traffic stops, 74 of those were non-discretionary. But when they did occur, there really wasn't much disproportionality between minority and non-minority drivers being stopped. And then this last uh, slide is the non-discretionary arrests. And this is where the officer really doesn't have much of a choice. They pretty much, it's like a warrant. They pretty much have to make an arrest. And, and, and we, see, um, we see disparity there. The odds ratio is up over two. But again, um, you can't really call that bias because the officer has stopped the car. Maybe there's a warrant on the driver. Maybe the driver's under suspension. The officer doesn't really have a choice. And the numbers are showing up the way they are because that's differential in, in offending there. That's what that is showing. Any questions on that? Well, what would be the, there's still the reason why the stop, right? Right. So, so they, yeah, that, and that's the first part, right? So that's why we look to, that's why we have to divide it out. We look to see if there's disparity, are, are, are blacks getting stopped more than whites? And we saw for the department about seven percentage points higher than the benchmarks. Mm -hmm. But once the stop occurs, then the officer has a lot of choices how that stop's going to turn out. And uh, when the officer has a great deal of choice, we find much lower levels of disproportionality than when the officer doesn't have a choice um, for arrests. Chris, what's an example of a non-discretionary arrest and a discretionary arrest. Can you give examples yeah. of both? Yeah, so um, a good example of a non-discretionary arrest would be a warrant, right? You, you stop a car, you go up to the driver, you get the driver's license, you run a warrant check, and this person has a warrant. That's, a, that's essentially an order from a judge telling the officer to go ahead and make an arrest. A non-discretionary arrest might be um, a situation where the officer has some judgment, for example, if the um, if um, the officer's looking at a at um, perhaps uh, whether or not I'm trying to think of a good a good example here of non-discretionary because they don't happen all that often. So it would be maybe um, uh, so the. 
the, the driver is creating a loud disturbance, let's say, and gets arrested for uh, disturbing the peace or something like that. The officer doesn't have to make an arrest there, but the officer decides to make an arrest. So those would be an example of discretionary arrests where the officer has, has a choice. OWIs, driving while barred, those types of things, the officer really doesn't have much of a choice. You can't, you can't really let a drunk driver go. I mean, you could, but you shouldn't do that. So they, they don't do that. And warrants, you can't do that. Uh, driving while barred, you can't just turn a blind eye to that. So you pretty much have to make a, an arrest in those situations. I hope that cleared it up. Yeah, thanks. So um, we also track consent searches, but the Iowa City Police Department has doesn't make consent searches since, <laughs> since the last two years. And last year, they only made one in 2018. So a consent search is when they don't have probable cause to search a car. And so they ask the driver, can we search your car? Um, there were some issues. I think officers were filling out their forms incorrectly when saying they were um, consent searches when they really weren't, when they were probable cause searches. And so um, once we talked with the officers at length about what the differences were and how they should fill out the forms, then pretty much the police department doesn't make those. So we can't, we can't analyze those data anymore. What we have started, though, is probable cause searches. So probable cause search would be if you go up to a car and say you smell marijuana in the car, which gives you probable cause to search. If you're sure it's marijuana, you have probable cause at that point, and you can search the inside of the car. And we do find some uh, disparity there. The odds ratio for that is 2.45. And what we track in conjunction with that is the hit rates. And what I mean by that is when those types of searches occur, do you find anything? Do you find evidence? Do you find contraband? And so we track it. So we track to see is there, so we see there's disproportionality in the probable cause search. Uh, minority drivers are two and a half times more likely to have a uh, probable cause search conducted on their car. And now this next slide shows the uh, hit rates. And actually, when probable cause searches occur, this number is below one. So you have to take the reciprocal of it, which means that when those um, searches occur, the officers actually find contraband or evidence from the white drivers of a, of a probable cause search twice as often as they do from the black drivers. So even though the uh, probable cause searching, a black driver is more likely to be searched based on probable cause, hit rates are higher for white drivers and black drivers. So that's something to keep an eye on as we go forward. And this final slide shows you um, some of the th outcomes over time. So you can see for citations, for example, that number since 2015 has hovered around one, which is good. Arrests. Um, is around two, but keep in mind that those are mainly non-discretionary. Uh, this search category here is for um, voluntary searches. And those numbers were traditionally around two. The last two years, we haven't been able to track those. And then the hit rates, you can see. So what we found, uh, and this is consistent with the, this year's finding, is that there are not higher hit rates for minority drivers than white drivers, than non-minority drivers. And then I have a couple of summary slides, but I just pretty much summarized it for you. So. I'll entertain your questions. Great, thanks. Uh, so do any of you have questions for Dr. Barnum? I know it's extremely hard to, com not a lot of other communities do this, right? It's only Davenport, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we've done uh, Davenport, the city of Dubuque. We have done Ames and the Iowa State Police Department. Okay. And is it possible, I know each community is of course different, but how are we comparing in terms of the other communities in terms of disproportionality? And a lot of times we look at that, the top 10 metro areas and in other factors, roughly how do we compare with those other um, communities? So do you mean in the stops or the outcomes? Both. Both. Um, 
Dubuque had a very low level of disproportionality. The, in fact, they were almost at zero levels of disproportionality. Davenport traditionally has around nine percentage points above our benchmarks, and I'm not, I haven't presented AIMS yet, so I'm not at liberty to, okay. to say theirs. Um, but, um, so you're a little better in Davenport, but you're not as good as Dubuque, if you want to use the vernacular. And, and to follow up on that, were you able to gather any information from Dubu Dubuque as to how they were able to achieve that, or was that sort of beyond the scope of the study? You're primarily looking at the data, not because I mean, that's spectacular. It's great work with Dubuque. We've had positive trend lines, but were you able to gather that you know that because it seems to me that just won't happen. That would be the result of a targeted activity on the part of the city of Dubuque. So it was interesting up there because um, the officers, I, I'm pretty sure the officers didn't. Know know, we look backwards at their data. They didn't know during the study period that they were being examined. So I'm not sure what what's being done up there. I will say this, that um, there's a lower level of, uh, there's a lower percentage of minority drivers on the road in Dubuque that might play into it. Um, the, the city's different in terms of its dynamics or where the stops occur and so forth. There's more stops made away from the city center in Dubuque than there is here. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's it's a little bit uh, apples to oranges. Yeah, it yeah. really is. Yeah. Okay. I I have a couple of questions. One one would be you know they we have these areas the city's broken down into these squares. Within those areas, do you map which corridors or which streets uh, the the stops are made? Uh, no, we don't get that information. So what, what I receive from the police department is I don't get an address where I don't get a, a ladder lawn or an address where the stop occurred. I just get observation zone 32 or whatever. But what we do do is within those zones, we watch a lot of different intersections when we're watching traffic. But I don't know exactly where within that mile the stops are being made. No. Would it be difficult to obtain that information? I think it's difficult for the police to get that. I think the way they're set up now, and in fact, I know that is, that's the case, because um, prior to the one mile square units, we didn't have anything. We just had the beat where it occurred, which is a huge area. And so they went to a lot of effort to get this. Ideally, what we'd like to see is a latitude and longitude of the stop and then, or uh, UTM coordinate is another thing. And then uh, we can actually compare that to census data directly and so on and so forth. That's done in some other communities, but um, it's it's based on the system you have in place a lot. And so to, to change that would probably be a, a major and costly undertaking. Okay. And then the other question I had is, have you done any studies in cities which employ traffic cameras? Davenport does. And what, if any, effect that has on disproportional stops? So what we've wanted to do, and I haven't been able to do yet, is look at the actual stops from the traffic cameras and compare it to what we find. Uh, we, we haven't done that yet, so I don't know what effect that has, but that would be a very interesting question. So there is 7% um, higher the benchmark for my minorities uh, when they're stopped? Across the city, yes. Across the city. Do you know, give us some examples of uh, reasons why they were stopped? Yeah. So we do have that information. I didn't present it. We, we can track whether it was for like an equipment violation or a moving violation. What's not presented in here are, say, calls for service. So these are all officer-initiated stops where the officer makes a decision to, to stop the car. Um, when I do look at the data that way, minorities tend to be stopped in higher numbers for equipment violations, and, and whites tend to be stopped more for moving violations. So back tail light out or? Yeah, or maybe even a license plate light out if you're getting really okay. down to brass tacks. Okay. Have you done any communities where within the state marijuana is legal? No. Okay. I'm curious about 
crime trends. Have you been able to do any analysis or look at least more a, a broader cross section in terms of as communities <laughs> have less disproportionate minority contact, we see positive crime re trend reductions? Can so, you make that case? So what's interesting is Davenport. Um, we've been doing Davenport since the beginning, 2005. And Davenport has, I don't know if you follow the news in Davenport very closely, but they have a pretty substantial problem with uh, neighborhood shootings in Davenport, particularly right around St. Ambrose, actually, just uh, south of, of the campus. And um, we find a police response to the shootings increases disproportionality, okay? What we haven't found, though, is whether whether that police response lowers the number of shootings. So that's a very interesting question, in which we really are looking at, um, and that's something that actually <clears throat> should be talked about at a community level. So, what do you want the police to do? They have a lot of shootings, say, on Gaines Street in Davenport, Gaines and say 17th Street. And if you live in that neighborhood, you get pretty tired of your cars being shot up all the time. So, you know. We want the police to do something, and so when the police go in there and they have special enforcement teams, which they call NETs, what happens is those NETs officers generally have very disparate numbers. And so in other words, minorities are being stopped at higher rates. But what we haven't been able to establish is whether that has any effect on the shootings or not. So it's the open question is, does the traffic stop lower shootings? You know, I don't know. I'd like to ask a couple questions that maybe Jody could answer uh, better than you, Chris. But uh, Jody, the, the first question I'd like to ask is whether the Community Police Relations Board members have been provided with a copy of Dr. Barnum's report and given a chance to interpret it from their perspective. Not before you, Mayor. I want you guys to have it first. Okay, But great. certainly, it's always on our website. It's always available. Um, and this is something that we can have put on the agenda now that he's presented the 2018 results to you folks uh, and talk to CPRB about that. Sure. Yeah, I think it's the kind of thing that would be of considerable interest to the board members. The other thing has to do with your own perspective. Basically, we see really good trends here in the data that Dr. Barnum's provided us but they still show disproportionality in, the, in, in a worrisome way. So what's your thoughts about now, ha having been on the job for, what, two and a half years mm -hmm. or thereabouts, what, what are your thoughts now about how to improve the situation? Yeah, so I stood here two and a half years ago and, and told you folks that, um, you know, there'd be some low-hanging fruit that we need to take care of right away, and that was the consent searches. I viewed it as a fishing expedition, and the stats showed that we weren't finding any more in a black driver's car than we were a white, so what are we doing? Why is it so disproportionate? Coupled with me telling them, quit just ripping cars apart because you're not finding anything, and, and they listened, you can, as you can see. Um, the courts have also started to rule that, you know, dog searches and, and waiting for canines to, to arrive at a, a traffic stop, and this happened in Illinois too, and, and some at the federal level is now prohibited by law, so we can't just hold the motors up and wait to do these, these dog sniffs and, and searches. So the courts have directed us, I've directed them, and so you've seen it kind of go to ground zero, uh, which is a good thing. We're not holding motors up, and you can see where the disproportionality started to to dip there. Um, now we deal with the PC side of it. What's the, the the probable cause? Okay, yeah, you can legally search it, but if there's disproportionality, which these are the first times we've measured those numbers, and and so I'm, this is new to me too within the last few weeks. Um, but that gives us something to sink our teeth into and know that that's eh, a problem, and, and let's correct it and start dissecting why is that happening? What are the searches for? How do we build the probable cause? And, and take a look at that and address that as well. So um, this is just another piece of the puzzle to get things corrected. Um, but overall, the way we've tried to change the culture in the police department, we're starting to see success. And, and I fully expect this to be a gradual change. This isn't gonna go from a, a, a number two um, disparity down to the one which is our parity, which is our target. Um, but it's trending down. So we had some successes last year with the outcomes and citations, and we continue in that mode, so I think we're good there. We get it. 
Um, but the, the stops themselves, I was glad to see the extremes come down. We had a guy out in right field, uh, and then we had him kind of center right, and, and now he's more towards center field, and that's where, we, you know, we, we need to to keep pulling that back, but that moved the median back too. So as a group, we're improving, and, and I, I'd love to see those. That's what I expected to see. Jeff stood here last year and said, we're gonna make progress, and we have. So I'm encouraged by those numbers. The officers are doing better. We did some distinct things, like do monthly checks of this. Instead of waiting, because it was, it was kind of like a surprise party for me. He would step up, and I'm like, oh, how'd we do? And we shouldn't be surprised by these numbers. We need to manage our folks and supervise them properly. So each month we look at these numbers and say, hey, what do you got going on? Where are you patrolling? Are you patrolling? And, and this came right from his training uh, when I came here because a lot of the folks, a lot of our officers had, had not been trained by Dr. Barnum to say, here's probably some issues that you need to correct. Are you patrolling your whole zone or are you just going to one neighborhood and stopping cars um, where there's a, a high percentage of black drivers for a taillight out? And we need to improve in that area. So um, yes, it, and I don't even know what those numbers are, but if there's a higher number of defective equipments in one neighborhood, in general, what we tell them is knock it off. It's You're not finding anything there that's not good for business. You're not saving lives. You're not reducing violent crime. Patrol your whole zone, go to those areas where there's hazardous violations and traffic crashes are occurring, where neighbors are complaining about speed and do your traffic enforcement in those areas and make a difference. Uh, so we continue to do that. Mostly what I find too is the folks I have out in right field are my new officers. Big hearts, but they're, they're full of energy and they really, they, they, have, they, they have to be shown how to police smarter and better. The, the academies teach them the basics about bias-based policing, and, but they don't teach them the mechanics. That's up to us and that's up to maturity and, and experience. Every one of our officers wants to do a good job. They want to please the community. They want to be fair. They want to be consistent. We train, 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 train. We lead, lead, lead. They get feedback from community uh, members all the time. Uh, we just have to show them how to do that. These numbers show they're responding. So I'm very pleased with that outcome. Um, so we have more work to do, but we're going in the right direction. And I think this, these numbers show it. Chief, marijuana has always been a huge source of disproportionality. What efforts, if any, has the department made related to marijuana enforcement specifically to get those numbers down? So the pure volume of marijuana that we're taking in has been reduced uh, I don't know, 50 fold. I mean, we just don't take in weed like we used to because it's not our priority. Um, certainly, you know, if you walk around, you know, drive around with 30 pounds of weed and we come across it, we're going to deal with that. Um, but we, you know, I've been a proponent of, of you know, making uh, possession of marijuana a simple misdemeanor, maybe make it into a civil infraction so we so we quit filling the jails with folks that, that have a joint on them because 10 hours away you can smoke weed in Colorado, but yet, you know, we're lodging people in jail for it. Um, so that, but that's where we sit legally. Uh, so the officers, and I tell the community this, it's against the law. When we run across it, we'll deal with it. But the officers have been told to think outside the box. You have discretion, make good decisions out there. Uh, you know, police enforce the laws, but do it fairly and consistently and know that you have the latitude and the discretion to take care of business uh, the way you see fit within our guidelines and within acceptable practices. And I think they're doing that. They're exercising better judgment. And, um, you know, we, we'd rather get the folks that are that are shooting guns in the neighborhoods and, and committing robberies and breaking into folks' homes and pick less on the, on the, the joint in the ashtray. We'll deal with the joint in the ashtray, but, but we're not likely to put someone in jail as often these days. Um, um, and I let the officers make that decision by leading them. Uh, we don't order them not to. We have discretion, but we're teaching them better. That's my take on it. When we run across it in the car, if if you're driving around smoking weed, that's a problem. Oh, that's uh, studies are really clear that whether you're drunk or high or intoxicated, you can't operate while impaired, and I'll never condone that. So if you're going to smoke the weed, you, you better find a good spot to do it and don't operate a car. So those are some of the probable cause searches he talked about, and we have to deal with those when we come across it, just as we would a can of beer between somebody's legs uh, while they're operating. Mm -hmm. Very Okay, you all remember I said I was hopeful we would end this discussion by 545. Uh, is there anybody else who really needs to ask I, a question? I'll just make a quick comment. Having listened to this report now for I'm not sure how many years we've sat here and had this every other year, but I'm just pleased to see the continued improvement. Um, and I think we owe a lot to you, Jody, as well as Dr. Barnum in terms of, you know, having the data and um, 
and your impact on the police force since you've been here. So glad to see it improve. Thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks to the officers. They're the ones doing the job. So, yeah, and Dr. Barnum, thanks for your good, really good work. Uh, it's great to see you again. Thanks so much for doing it and coming in and guiding us through it. Sure. Okay. We could move on to our next item, which is uh, questions about agenda items. Does anybody have any questions? Clarification of agenda items, that is. I had a, just a quick question on item 8A about the separation distance for the fuel dispensing equipment. I mean, that's going to come before us again at some point in time uh, for resolution of some sort or change. It, it, when that comes before us again with more information, could we have something maybe from the fire department as far as their opinion on what a safe distance is? Would that be possible? Sure. It is addressed in the fire code as well, but we can provide something from the fire department. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about item 8C, uh, which is establishing an urban renewal area for the Forest View uh, situation. Uh, when I looked at the map showing the boundaries of the urban renewal area, I sh saw that it extended uh, well to the east of North Dubuque Street. And I was surprised to see that. And so I'm just wondering why the proposed urban renewal area includes that property. Yeah, um, I can bring it up real quick. I think the, the answer is it extends east to capture the four legs of the intersection. The new intersection will actually punch through to that frontage road, and then we'll be able to close the access down on Foster Road. If you can picture that um, access drive that comes up from Foster, it's really close to the Dubuque intersection. And, and so that, that separation distance is really tight. On the east side of Dubuque? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes. No, on the east side, yes. Okay. And there's that frontage road there. Yeah. So the new intersection with Forest View Drive will be a four-way intersection, and we're going to connect into that frontage drive so that we can oh. close that. Okay, so there's no intention access. whatsoever of using any of that property for some kind of development. No. One kind no, it's, right? it's solely for the intersection and on the west side for the trail up to the interstate. Okay. Any other agenda items needing clarification? Nine G, the letter from the person, uh, the tenant about um, landlord scam. I was going to check with the um, legal department. If, if I'm not familiar, I guess I've never had to have a background check for by an employer. If it's typical for the employer and or a landlord to charge a fee to do the background check on the person. I think most landlords do charge that fee. Um, the city and its programs, Section 8 in public housing, does not. We, we pay that. Um, but it's something that the city can't, can't legislate. It's a matter between the landlord and the, and the applicant or the landlord and the tenant. One piece of correspondence, item 9E, which is an email from Ann Christensen. Uh, Ann, who's very active in 100 Grannies, and we've seen her here before, suggests several climate-related actions we can take. One of them caught my eye, and I just want to mention it to you. It's a, a document that she references titled Game Changers. And I skimmed through that and saw some material, some information about what other cities are doing with regard to uh, improving, increase, reducing the carbon emissions from new buildings and existing buildings. And I, I was really struck by how th that report seemed to be pretty helpful with regard to the kind of situations we face, especially with regard to what happens if your state legislature has basically preempted your ability to do anything about energy efficiency. Of course, we don't know what that situation is yet now because of what we've learned. Uh, but still, I thought the report looked like it had some uh, considerable value. 
surely we should say something about an item 9H, which is a proposed amendment to uh, the, uh, the CPRB's ordinance and bylaws and inviting us to appoint a liaison. I see or Orville is out there in the audience, and I know Orville intends to comment during the formal meeting, so I'm, I'm not going to ask Orville to come up, but I, I have spoken with one of the CPRB members, and he told me that the, it's our understanding that the liaison would not be expected to attend meetings of the CPRB, though the propo proposed amendment does not say that. But, but still, that's the expectation, that they would not have to attend. And also, that the, the that particular board is unique in that it details, it, it deals with topics that are very s emotionally charged. And some of the other boards deal with emotionally charged issues too, but I think the CPRB is unique in that sense. So, uh, I, I, I think we should probably take that into account when we're getting to the ordinance. We don't have the ordinance before us as a proposed ordinance yet, so we don't really need to discuss it right now. But I just wanted to share that uh, a little bit of insight I got from talking with a CPRB board member. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, it would be a point of contact for that, it, that entire board so that they know um, which individual, you know, they can always go to. That's that's what's being recommended, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, I just, I don't know, can, can we talk about this more now? I, I don't know how deep we, we want, can go into it legally. Well, it is an item not, I mean, it is the time for um, agenda items, so you, you can if you'd like, unless you want to wait, and you, you, the other option would be to be pull it off the consent and have the presentation by Mr. Towns, and then you could speak with it then, too, however you want to do it. Yeah. Is, what do you think, is there anything, I guess my question is, this is a recommendation from them, the proposed amendment. So is this automatically going to show up on a formal agenda regardless of any discussion that we have at this point? Yeah, unless you are completely against it, we wouldn't go through that exercise. This is just, this is an opportunity for you to provide direction, but. Yeah, so we should okay. probably should discuss okay. it some more now. So yeah. one of the things that I'm concerned about is that I don't fully understand why the board members cannot already on their own initiative contact any one of the council members to convey concerns and uh, perhaps when Orville speaks later on he can address that and uh, but I, I don't quite understand what would inhibit anybody from doing that in terms of contacting any individual council member I agree Jim and I I think it sets a, while there while you can argue that there's a difference in the kind of material and and topics that they cover and the emotional aspect of things i guess if we'd had a lot of history of strong disagreements between the CPRB and the police chief um you know, over these internal investigations, et cetera, with, with our officers' uh, situations, then I can understand the need for more communication, but I still don't think a single liaison. I don't, I, for something like this, I, as you just said, I think any member of that commission should feel free to talk to anybody on council, and different members of that group may feel more comfortable with different members of council. I mean, you know, Orville might feel more comfortable talking to, you know, Bruce than me, or, you know, vice versa, and the same thing with other people. And so to appoint a liaison, I think, can almost make it feel to people on there that this really is the person that I am supposed to go to if I want to have any communication. And I, I certainly feel that all of us in any discussions we've had are very open and willing to have any conversations with members of the commission about, you know, any kinds of issues or topics that um, are coming up. So I, and I am, even though it's different in many ways, I am also concerned about this setting a precedent of other commissions then wanting 
in the feeling of importance of their commissions that well if they have one we should have one and I just I, I don't I don't see the necessity of it now, I want to ask Sue a question because this really has to do with legal matters the, my question does anyhow have do you know Sue whether the the, the members of the CPRB are advised not to speak individually with council members or conversely whether they are advised that if they have any particular concerns that they want to discuss privately with individual council members they are free to do that the board has independent counsel pat ford is an attorney that represents the board so our office does not advise the board or board members but but it certainly they are free to speak with you absolutely well yeah. I, I, but yeah. what i'm asking is what the board members understand they are free or not free to do that's what i'm wondering about yeah, and that i don't know because like i said pat ford represents the board i we don't could so. you find sure, out sure absolutely absolutely we can talk Do. to pat sure. i think from my perspective when we're looking at and we're on several committees here were assigned and um, one of the things um, when i was assigned to the um, the committee where we do you're asking me if i knew about taxes and all that other stuff and i actually did but i but i did respect um, you cautioning to put me on a board that i knew nothing about you know put me uh, so i do think that when we're talking about um, maybe the you know this particular uh, you, you know, board, the CPRB, if if amongst us, you know, there was someone that really could relate, not, um, we're talking about individuals that may have difficulties uh, processing, someone that's a good listener, I'm not trying to say we're counselors to them or something like that, but um, maybe there is someone here that has more of a, um, that's their, they love, you know, being a part of the CPRB on whatever level, um, maybe giving them guidance on who to go to next or if they're having concern. I'm not sure exactly what all their reasons are and hopefully we'll get that tonight. But although I do hear the hesitancy to a point one and I would agree, um, that that is concerning, but I also would agree that we should probably look at this uh, from a different angle just to see if it is something that we would be willing to do uh, to appoint someone that um, really can be a, a, a point of contact person, not limiting them to any other counselors, but um, if, if I was on one of the boards, um, knowing the council members, um, many of them don't know who we are. Some of them don't. Some of them do uh, very well. Um, so maybe, you know, having a little more relationship with our boards, and this could be something that we may decide, you know, for other boards that get council more involved on some level. Um, although I know it's a slippery slope when you have one member representing or talking. Um, but I do see that it could be a benefit. We're on other boards and commissions, and we're representing, you know, all seven of us. To me, what it comes down to is accountability and communication. You know, I talked to Orville a little bit about this, and I would not support this if this were a requirement that we'd have another board opportunity, because frankly, I think we have to be very cautious about expending our own uh, emotional and capital in terms of being able to sit on another commission. But as I understand what the recommendation is, it is not that, it's not gonna be sitting there. It will be to have level of accountability in terms of having someone that is designated to be the liaison to the Citizens Review Board. And I think, Jim, you at one point had floated the opportunity of the committee concept in terms of urban planning, streets, and ultimately we decided not to do that in part because to have a quorum of three, like if you had a social justice committee, that would have been very complex in terms of, and, and I think in terms of staffing, we ultimately concluded it was not a good use of our time 
uh, to have so many committees that council was involved with. But I think this is much simpler. Um, I think what they're just talking about is just the liaison. Maybe because they're liaison, they may, they may listen in on a meeting um, once a year, although they wouldn't have to. And they would basically be able to receive the information. And I think as long as it would make clear that we're not to be the sole conduit of information, I think it could be very favorable. And one of the other things that I'd like to see just in general, and I think this is a positive step forward towards that, is that I think it's important that when we sit up here as a, as a, as a council, we get communication through traditional channels. I think it's good to have direct communication and, and figure out other avenues of communication in terms of being able to get information, especially since we're talking about at most, you know, mainly a listing role. Um, and if we do it for a year and determine that it does not set a favorable precedent or maybe it is a little bit more wattage or it turns out that maybe they are relying too much on one particular counselor, um, we can certainly reevaluate. Um, but I, I think this is a, a sensible proposal uh, that we should explore. So I would support that. Um, and then, of course, we'll be able to hear what Orville has during, to say during yeah. the formal What do the rest comments. of you think? Well, I'd like to hear the story behind, you know, mm -hmm. The request, so um, I don't really have a strong opinion one or one way or the other at this point. I'd just like to know, you know, where this came from. I'm I'm anxious to hear too, also from Orville, because it, it it talks about uh, if they're, they, the member doesn't feel comfortable airing concerns related to the inner workings of the CPRB openly during CPRB meetings. So, you know, what exactly? Clarify exactly what is that? Is it like the members amongst themselves, or the actual decisions that are being made? That's what I thought initially. Like uh, the police versus the board and their decisions, but this makes it sounds like it's kind of amongst the members themselves, some disagreements. So I'd, I'd like to know more about that. Okay, do you all want me to have this pulled from the uh, consent calendar and deal with it separately? Yes. Yeah. I do. Can do? Okay, let me make a note of that. I want to know one other thing that really has to do with, if we proceed on this, I note that the, uh, uh, the, the, the CPRB is recommending that this liaison be appointed at the beginning of each fiscal year, and that's out of sync with all the other appointments we make, I mean, in terms of who on the council serves and what kind of capacity. I would think it'd be better to have that done at the start of the calendar year, yeah. or, you know, when we do the other appointments, the, uh, the other council appointments, it is. Okay, so let me make a note of this. What, does anybody have uh, other um, questions about other agenda items? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. So how about the information packet for the June 6th packet? IP4, just thank the staff for the strategic plan update. If anybody thinks our staff isn't doing anything, they need to read this. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot going on and a lot of progress being made. I wanted to thank the mayor for IP2 uh, for sending this information. I thought it was very... Um, intriguing um, how just through the article just addressing affordable housing and that type of stuff um, I even learned that there will be a conference in um, New Orleans uh, related to this and so um, it, 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 it that is something that you know of great interest on what other cities are doing to combat housing shortages nationwide and um, I would love to, as a council of, you know, um, and people within the community just to continue to um, look at solutions for our community to create affordable housing opportunities. Yeah, to that end, Bruce, there was a really good um, piece on NPR this morning where they were talking about the affordable housing issue has really started to become part of the national campaigns, and that was very good to see. It has. Um, I'd like to mention item three, the uh, Iowa City Automated Vehicles at, uh, Adaptation and Equity Plan. 
done by the University of Iowa's School of Urban and Regional Planning students. I was really thrilled to see this. I'm very pleased with the product that they came up with. And when Simon and I were driving back and forth from Des Moines, I mentioned that uh, it's the quality of that report is so much higher than what I used to see as a professor 25 years ago or 20 years ago. It is very well done and does exactly what I personally hoped it would do, which is to let us see the possible ways in which we could influence how autonomous vehicles get used in our city by showing us points of a possible action. And also to think in terms of incremental steps between now and whatever that future date is when we're flooded with autonomous vehicles. So I think they just did a great job. That was an incredibly dense report. <laughs> yeah, it was. God. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, a lot of words. the I think two professors were actively involved, Scott and, and, uh, and Jerry. Uh, so they, they must have helped a lot. I was also very impressed with that because, as everybody knows, I'm technically challenged and really I have difficulty with my iPhone even. So I've always had trouble wrapping my head around the idea of automated vehicles and how they would operate and function and where they would drive. And uh, this cleared up a lot of the questions on that and even gave a time frame of perhaps even between now and 20, even 20 years from now. Uh, also, as you mentioned, the incremental steps, I was wondering as I was reading all of it, uh, how it could be incorporated into our transit study and it even answered some of those questions and how they can go hand in hand, which is good. Yeah, really good connections. Yeah. I, I was going to ask, and I assume that this will be presented to the consultant who's doing the, so they can at least see this. Yeah. Thanks. Good. We need to come up with some possible topics for the joint entities meeting agenda. So that's IP number five. Do you all have any suggestions about possible items to put on that agenda? I didn't know if I'd want to talk about our the deer management plan, um, or maybe our, our the hate crimes ordinance also. I don't know if either of, the, either of those. Well, let's uh, see if there are any other topics okay. that we want to uh, possibly put on the agenda. So hate crimes, deer management, others? Oh, I know we're going to be talking about climate action. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's premature to see what people, you know, just kind of, uh, even mention that we're going to be having that conversation. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that also because we will have just held a work session discussion about the climate action plan, and the school board has also been discussing what to do. I don't know how that their discussion's <coughs> gone, but there's some overlap there as well. To that end, I know typically those meetings are, for lack of a better term, sort of show and tell. Uh, we usually don't convene for purposes of deciding something, and, and maybe we don't want to break that precedent now. But that would be something, I think the climate action, regardless of whatever the, cl the uh, council decides, um, I, I guess I would like to see to some degree that we at some point do that with the other entity. And that may just not be feasible given quorum issues and those sorts of things, but I, I would like to see that in the future. Well, if we wanted to, we could, at a minimum, simply present a very brief overview of our climate action plan, and then any specific actions that come out of our discussion on the 14th. Or is that the right date? No. Uh, it's the second, <clears throat> second of July. Second of July. Thank you. And that's that's doable, isn't it, Jeff? From a staff point of view, yeah. Uh, well, I'd suggest we do that. Uh, so, do you all want to put deer management? Mm. I don't know. If they care about really, it. we're not cl we're not clear on what we're what doing. We're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we that's have true. that. We well, share we're going to vote on something. Yeah, that's no, true. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so, I'm not hearing excitement about putting that on the. I mean, I, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, what we decide tonight as well as what we plan to do on July 11th um, with the three counselors going just have a discussion I'm, I'm assuming with staff a, a mention of it yeah just a mention okay. how about hate crimes which is another thing that Bruce mentioned that's a possibility that might be of interest to them I'm not sure what's going on 
you know, on a more regional level, but um, I think it would be good for them to know what's happening here. Okay. Might be something that they'd be interested we can do that. in. All right. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Sounds like there's enough interest in that. How about any topic that uh, concerning what other governmental entities are doing? Got anything on your minds? Well, one topic, it's, this is not a super urgent topic, but we are entering biking season. And I think sometimes the updates in terms of improvements the county, the Coralville has done in terms of biking infrastructure. Um, I think it'd be interesting to hear updates on that and we can update what we've done. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's beyond the scope of what we want to do, but I always well, think that that's Well, we could ask the topic. county to update, to yeah. provide us with an update, that'd be a yeah. good thing. Is that like hitting the trails? You could, we could just ask the, an short. MPO staff member. Sure. Who's, you know, they work with each of the communities on the bike improvements to give an overview kind of from a regional perspective of all the improvements happening this year and maybe next. Yep. I'd like to hear that. Anyway. Okay. I do think we received that the last meeting though. Updates on the bike, on the bike trails. We received that. At the MPO. Mm -hmm. At the MPO. JC. At the MPO meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that'd be duplicating what yeah, you've already kind of just. Yeah. No, well, I didn't know that, so okay. I didn't either. It does sound like it would be redundant. Okay, that's fine. <coughs> we don't have to come up with anything else, so if we are silent at this point, that's okay with everybody, probably. IP7, update on the Climate Action Grant Awards. I was glad to see that. Nice mix of projects. And thanks to Ashley for providing that memo and summary. Can we move on to the June 13th packet? With regard to IP4, I just want to emphasize with regard to July the 2nd that we will be discussing the climate action plan. We'll get an update concerning it and surely take into account what we've been hearing from climate strikers and their allies about more aggressive actions we should be taking. Yes. I guess I had a, a couple of questions on the, the uh, update on the Emerald Ash Borer. Mm -hmm. um, so IP6. In reading, pardon me? IP6. IP6. Uh, the, the report states that we are, it started with an estimated 400 that were potential candidates uh, out of 3,500 trees. So that's roughly 11.5% of the overall ash population. So the, the rest are kind of beyond treatment. Is that, is that how I in, am to interpret that? So in the RFP that we put out for the EAB treatment, uh, we, we stated 400 plus. Um, and so we left room at council's uh, direction last fall to expand uh, into that marginal category that we had talked about last fall. Um, the original 400 set uh, was with a, a diameter range of eight inch or excuse me, 12 inch in diameter to 30 inch in diameter. So we, we leave that plus category to expand that out uh, to eight inch on the small end up to 40 inch on the larger end. Um, a couple kind of caveats with our inventory, the boundary data that we have uh, is based on the county parcel data. So um, we know, and we've known this since we took the inventory that there are some trees collected in our inventory or that show up in our inventory that may be actual private trees until we do um, lot line uh, inspections. And so that 3,500 number, yes, we, we show 3,500 ash trees, but there's some there's some variance in there as far as the data. Um, secondly, with uh, council's direction as far as targeting neighborhoods, um, especially north side neighborhood for treatment. The 3500 also includes 
um, areas of, of creek bank, river bank um, that, that have ash on them. So we don't consider those um, as high value areas for treatment. Um, so the 400 plus is, is our, our starting point and expanding off of that depending on uh, inspections by our contractor and, and how the, the treatment process goes. And the, so it sounds like the inspections are still ongoing. We don't. Yes. We don't, we don't at this particular point in time know how many ash will actually be treated. The, the inspections are ongoing. They will be um, throughout the whole treatment process. So the contractor is, I believe they completed 60 um, treatments as of today, as of this afternoon, um, which started at the end of May. Um, and we have right now um, Amendment 3 to the contract. We have 100, approximately 170 f um, for them to, to work through with more being inspected as they're working through as they're working through those. So yes. And then the you know that appendix H I included or referenced because first of all I, I, I don't know if anyone on council had seen it. Um, you know in fact I hadn't seen it until just recently. And it, it talked about citizen engagement in the treatment. Is is that still part of the plan? Uh, how, how does that factor into what yep. we're doing? So we have a, a, that was one of the directions that we had from last fall um, and one of the areas that we identified in the forest management plan that you reference um, is public engagement. And so written into the RFP, the contractor, we have them um, send out notification to the adjacent property owner and then the property owners on either side that this particular tree is being injected. Um, we mark that in the inventory. Um, once it gets treated, it's tagged on the tree. Um, and and so we, we've taken those steps with the notification process for those individual trees and those individual property so, owners. So how would that then translate into the the citizens, or the, I guess in, your, in, the, in the instance you're describing, the neighbors, I guess, becoming involved in the cost sharing on the, um, the treatment. We, we don't have any cost sharing uh, program in place. That's, um, what, that's what I was, it's, it's in Appendix H, it talks about that as part of the EAB program or response, but I wasn't aware of any, that anything along those lines was, was actually in place. We don't have a cost share in place. And I, I think the timing of when the urban forest management plan was finalized and the direction that we received last fall, um, essentially we, we took the stance that any trees, any ash trees that are treatable, the city will treat them with city funds. Those that are not will be removed. But those are the ones that are on city property. Correct. Zach, quick question along those lines. Um, the 400 plus that you identified were, were partly done by neighborhood, as you said. Um, how do you handle a call from a resident that may not have, may not be in one of those neighborhoods, but has an, has an ash tree that they may want to preserve? Do we have the ability to work with a homeowner um, uh, to, to add that tree, even though it maybe didn't get in that first? Uh, we, we do, so that, that's a great question. So we have had a couple calls um, outside of the Northside neighborhood area where we did our initial inspections last fall. Um, and, and we've worked with those property owners uh, as far as uh, adding those to the list for treatment. And that's actually one thing that we've proactively started to do in our inspections, um, just so we're not focusing in one area of town because we have seen um, a concentration of infestation within the Northside neighborhood. We would like to try and get ahead of it in working with our contractor. That's what they've expressed as well, is that in other areas of the city where the infestation may have not spread as quickly, those are great candidates for treatment and long-term treatment and saving those trees. Yeah. I, for clarification, I don't recall putting that kind of emphasis on a particular area. I had always viewed it as something that applied to the city as a whole. 
I think the emphasis was placed on streets with large amounts of ash canopy. Right. Well, that, and that, that and that's correlates in, to those older neighborhoods. Right. That that's in Appendix H. It does emphasize avoiding, you know. And we are situation. following that recommendation. Yeah. Any other questions for Zach? Thanks. Okay, any other items on that information packet? I think IP9 was interesting. Um, everyone deserves a park within 10 minutes <laughs> of walking from their home. And so um, Iowa City has 49 parks and 83% 83, 83 of our residents have parks within 10, 10 minutes of their home. So I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that same report did identify Trust for Public Land as a good source of information uh, where the gaps were in Iowa City. They actually have a map showing, mm -hmm. fi I think it was five areas that, um, you know, if if you plugged in a park there, it would fill the gap, in, in this general area, it would fill that gap. So, so we have- I didn't talk about any plans for filling the gap, though. No, I just identified, yeah, just know, identified yes. where they where they would go. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that data was collected prior to Riverfront Crossings Park, as far as the percentage of our land that's utilized in, in parks? Because that seems like a large mass of, of land that might have bumped this the numbers 2019. up. 2019. So yeah, I, I'm not sure if that was captured or not. We, we have a number of uh, future park sites. So oftentimes a residential subdivision, they'll dedicate land. It may not become a park. We, we may not accept it for several years after you approve the, the subdivision. So some of those may fall into these areas. I haven't gone through with that level of detail to check. Any other items? Oh, just um, IP7, which I included. Uh, I, I included it in, well, one, I, I think it's really aligns very well with what how I've perceived the problem or challenge with parking and that we are in kind of a transition period, you know, where, yeah, we would all love to say, let's just do away with the minimums and, you know, so on and so forth. But we're not there yet. We're especially not there yet in Iowa City. So, you know, we do have to pay attention to the um, the fact that we are, as of now, uh, and more or less an auto-dependent community, and we need to accommodate and, and account for that. Um, I thought it was especially interesting as it related to any, you know, our future conversation on Northside Marketplace. Uh, but I think it had relevance to riverfront crossings as well. Basically, you know, the, the core, the greater core of Iowa City, I think it had relevance. Mm -hmm. Parking is definitely a challenge, but I do think we need to be a little creative and think outside of the box and be a little um, adventurous in the solutions that we create for our city. Yeah, I, I thought he had really excellent strategies and gave a kind of a case study of what had been done in um, Savannah, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, that I could see being applied here very easily. Certainly seem to apply to the north side marketplace discussion Definitely. and what we've asked Opticos to do in terms of visioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we could move on to council updates if you are willing. Well. All right, council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. So we'll start with John and move to the left. I don't have anything to report. Fair enough. Rockney. <laughs> City of Literature, we're just sort of doing an evaluation process at this point, uh, sort of a year in review. Not a lot of else, other things are happening. We're sort of gearing up for the fall. I just had to sign some kind of letter on John Kenyon's behalf, or upon his request, I should say. I can't remember what it was about. Jeff, do you remember? No, well, I guess I'm the one that saw it. <laughs> Touch base uh, yeah, it had John. something to do. Oh, it had to do with. Uh, mm, yeah, it had something to do with the fact that we know our country no longer contributes funds to UNESCO, is yeah, that right? But it doesn't affect the designation. Yeah, yeah, so that had some bearing on some process that uh, 
had to do with, I think, reviewing applicants for new, for, for new UNESCO sites. city yeah. literature designations. Yep. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Bruce? Um, there are no updates for one committees. No. It's called summer schedule. Yes. <laughs> uh, Rockney Adass, the last meeting about the mobile help task force, uh, did get a, uh, an announcement that uh, the first meeting of that mobile home task force committee will be on Tuesday the 25th at 1 o'clock, and it's in, in correlation with the Affordable Homes Coalition. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have more information later. Will that, I assume it will be a, not a public meeting, or it will be a public meeting? Okay. I, I would assume it's public. Okay. It was invitation because I was okay. on the list from Sarah, but it's part of the Iowa City uh, Coalition, okay. Affordable Housing Coalition, so I would think okay. you could. It was on my list as well. Um, Mazahir will not be here for that meeting, presumably, and Sarah emailed to see if somebody else from council would like to sit in on that first meeting in her spot. So, so if you wanted to. W which date is it? Tuesday the 25th at 1 o'clock. Of June? Of, of June. Yeah, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rockney? Okay, yep. good. Why don't you do it? Is that it? For me. Susan? Um, Access Center continues to move along. We had a two-hour meeting with the Board of Supervisors at their work session last week, um, getting a presentation from MELD, which is the company that's doing all the branding. Mm -hmm. So really trying to identify everything that's related to this project to come up with a brand, to come up with a name. Um, and I mean, it, it's... It, I'm impressed. I'm just really impressed with the details. Not being a marketing person, I never would have thought to ask all the different kinds of questions. We did a four-hour session a couple of weeks prior to that, and then they came back with a two-hour presentation um, and a few question and answer, uh, a little bit of question and answer time. But really excited about the work they're doing and how they're really condensing all this into what will be a, a good, consistent vision and brand um, and a way to communicate to um, lots of stakeholders, the general public, law enforcement, governmental entities, et cetera, what this project is, what this place is, and you know how it can and should be used and who it will serve. So uh, they're lot, doing a lot of really good work for us, so looking forward to seeing more. Susan, are there any websites up yet or no. websites explaining the concept in general? One of the things they will be doing will be developing a website. Yeah. Um, there'll be kind of a pre-open website and then a post-opening website. Yeah. But They've just really been engaged in the last couple of months, yeah. so they don't, I mean, they go through everything. They're going to, you know, they don't have a name yet. Okay. They'll develop colors. I mean, just all kinds of detail. So, no, there is no website. Yeah, because one of the things that came up on Facebook the other night is someone was saying, oh, it'd be really nice if we had this sort of center and we would lower the intakes in jails and we would have crisis funding and there'd be a place where people could go. And I said, well, it's interesting you should say that because that is in the works. And so it's, I suppose you just need to work out more of those details before they can really project exactly what we're going to be doing. But it's great to see that progress. Yep. Okay, great. It looks like I'm the last person, and this is the, will be the last item for our work session. So the Convention and Visitors Bureau Board will be meeting on the 20th of this month, two days from now. Um, I, I don't want to talk any more about it, though. I do want to mention the Metro Coalition, which, for those who don't know, is a coalition of the 10 largest cities in Iowa, and it meets periodically and certainly annually and has a shared legislative agenda each year. So we met today, Simon and I drove up there together, and so Simon, I want you to feel free to elaborate on anything I say. I'm gonna provide sort of a broad summary of what we heard. So we, uh, the, we members of the Metro Coalition, reviewed the 2019 legislative session, how that affected our various cities and what we thought about it. We also discussed the coalition's strategic goals and strategies for the 2020 session. And that was pretty enlightening because I think uh, David Edelman and others uh, with Cornerstone, which is the firm that uh, helps the Metro Coalition, provided us with some pretty good insight into the Republican leadership in the House and Senate about what their priorities are 
and how they might, what they are likely to be moving on in the next legislative session. So that led us to um, uh, probe that a little bit more and to think more strategically about how we and other members of the Metro Coalition could usefully spend our time over the next six months trying to get ahead of the game, if you will, and try to have better connections with the Republican leadership uh, to the extent that that would be helpful and otherwise have ways of framing certain issues in a way that would be fruitful from a Metro Coalition point of view. I thought that was very helpful. Yeah, and then uh, David Edelman with <coughs> Cornerstone drew our attention to the relationship between property tax reform, which is likely to be a hot topic for the, uh, for the legislature again, but the property tax reform, the mental health levy, and funding for I Will, which is the water pollution related initiative that made, has been approved, but there's no funding for it yet. So there, apparently the leadership is thinking about ways to tie these together and nothing's clarified at all, but they're trying to figure out how to get property tax reform, but also provide some funds for these other two things that matter to them. Edelman also drew our attention to how the leadership is uh, likely to act with regard to TIF and state tax credits. And a key part of what he said with regard to TIF is that the, the chairman of which committee, Senate committee, chairman of the Senate committee? Yeah, Senate Ways and Means. Uh, yeah, Randy Feaster had is going been to be uh, an opponent of doing anything about TIF, but now that's been changed. That person is no longer the chair of the, that particular committee. So it seems likely they might take some action with regard to TIF, which probably would not be good from a city point of view. I, and the de details I can't fill in. Uh, Edelman also discussed backfill, what the leadership might do with regard to that, and home rule, and how they, the leadership thinks about home rule with regard to many of these key issues that we've been facing. Simon, do you want to elaborate on any of that? Yeah, I think on a number of these issues, what came out of today is how important it's going to be to work with other stakeholders throughout the session. Um, you know, the relationship between backfill and mental health uh, levy funding that goes to the county uh, will be very important, and those are going to be related. And so making sure that we're reaching out to the county and working with them um, throughout the session will be important. Uh, the TIF conversation uh, largely will focus on, or uh, today largely, largely focused on the uh, school district uh, foundational levy. Uh, so that's the piece of the school district levy that we captured through TIF that the state backfills. Uh, so uh, the state has an interest in it in that it affects their budget as well. Uh, so we'll need to make sure that we're reaching out to the school district uh, throughout that process as well. Um, the other thing that uh, was noted today was uh, the alcohol and beverages division is unlikely to uh, propose specific language uh, based on their stakeholder uh, interviews. So we're going to uh, want to work with other cities to craft some language ourselves that hopefully we can get in front of the legislature and uh, maybe see some movement on next year. All right, I guess I should mention one other thing. Uh, note that I said that the Metro Coalition consists of the 10 largest cities and they all are 50,000 or above in population. Well, Ankeny is now more than, has more than 50,000 people. So the question was, should we invite Ankeny to join the Metro Coalition? And the answer was, dis the f despite the fact that Ankeny City Council seems to be uh, considerably different from ours in particular, but many of the other cities as well, in terms of its own political leanings, that uh, in the end we decided that it would be good to invite Ankeny to join the Metro Coalition and be the 11th member. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think that's about all I had to say and about all we had to have to say for this work session. So thanks, we'll reconvene at seven o'clock.